So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Malaysian French Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we wish you a very warm welcome and bonjour for those who are logged in from France. In 2022, Malaysia has approved 262 billion ringgit of investment project. That's about 52 billion euro. Out of which, 163 billion ringgit are foreign direct investments. We are here today to share with you about a state which has been cruising way under the radars and who has been in 2022 the third destination state for all this investment, Sarawak, located on Borneo Island. Largest state by size, known for its diverse indigenous culture rainforest and natural beauty. It is also a very rich state in terms of natural resources and has developed a very strong policy on green energy. The state budget has drastically increased this past years and Sarawak has gained strong political influence at federal level since the last general election. With for the first time a deputy prime minister of Malaysia coming from the land below the wind. Last but not least, it's important also to mention that Sarawak is well located next to Kalimantan, the Borneo state of Indonesia, that is projected to have the strongest development growth in the region for the coming 30 years. So ladies and gentlemen, together with me today, we have our board, of, our board director from Sarawak, Alexis Vandulok who will tell us more about our speaker guest for this team. Thank you, Alexi. Uh, thank you, Gilles, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome from the, uh, the land of the Hornbills. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Dr. Philip Ting, who is the Deputy President of the Sarok Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the uh, Sarawak Business Federation. Um, he sits on various different boards of uh, government-linked companies and academia, and is uh, very, very well versed to talk about the topic uh, today. Uh, over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Philip. Okay, hello, hi, hi. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, hello, good afternoon, and uh, to friends uh, on this, uh, this webinar, I saw that uh, Paul Revelli, my good old friend is, uh, is, is on it. Uh, Paul knows Sarawak extremely well. Uh, hello, Paul. And thank you very much uh, to you, Jill, as well as to uh, uh, Alex uh, Wongulot, uh, whom I've known for a long, long time. And, I've, and also hello to you, uh, Mr. Lozak. Okay, I'll, I've been given 10 minutes to uh, say a few words about Sarawak and uh, why it is a good destination to invest. And I'll share with you some of the opportunities, some of the some of the weaknesses and some of the dangers to look out for if you're going, uh, thinking of investing into Sarawak. Quickly, Sarawak is a very large state, 124,000 uh, square kilometers. It, it, it is 40% uh, the size of the whole of Malaysia. It, the actual figure is actually 37%, but it's pretty close to 40% of Malaysia's land mass it's situated on the island of Borneo. Um, it has a very autonomous uh, uh, constitution and the state runs pretty or not autonomously from the Malaysian, uh, from Malaysia. Uh, you know, many people are surprised that you need to, to, to get, you, you need a, a visa to visit Sarawak, even for Malaysian, you still need a visa uh, and a passport or, a, or other IC to enter Sarawak. And Sarawak has got its own work permit rules and, and has got autonomy in, on land matters, has got autonomy on technology, it's got autonomy, on immigration, it's got autonomy, on education, and a lot of other things. So anyway, uh, uh, there's just a background. I'm sure you'll find out more. Uh, Sarawa has got 2.9 million people, uh, and uh, the Kuching, the capital city, has got 800,000 people. It's a fairly uh, well-developed uh, little city in, in Malaysia, Kuching, and it's always been voted one of the most livable cities in Malaysia. Kuching. Now, um, I now quickly go to this. Now, the uh, Sarawak Business Federation that I'm also deputy president of uh, has is an umbrella organization of 20 associations 
in the state of Sarawak. And uh, you can get, you can Google that, www.svf.gov.my, I think. Anyway, Google that and you find out there are 20 associations. And uh, between us, these 20 associations, uh, we probably deal with about 70 to 80% of Sarawak's private sector GDP and probably employ about 80% of all people in the state. The members of this 20 associations that is represented by the Sarawak Business Federation, which will be happy to host any delegation that you may want to mount from, uh, from France. Now, the whole core of the state is, uh, they came up with this uh, back in 2019 during the COVID, but they call it the post-COVID development strategy. This is what I'm putting on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, on the screen right now. This basically is Sarawak's Vision 2030. We always call it uh, Sarawak Vision 2030, even though it's officially is called PCDS, Post-COVID Development Strategy 2030. You can Google that as well. I don't need to go through in big detail with you uh, with the 10 minutes that I've got. But if you go through that, the whole stick now is uh, geared up for those six economic sectors in the middle. You can see them, agriculture, tourism, forestry, uh, mining, services and manufacturing. These are the six core areas in which the state is focused on. And they're supported by seven enablers. You know, you go now digital transformation, innovation, education, human capital, basic infrastructure, utilities, transport, and renewable energy. All these are expanded in great detail. You can Google that and you get more information on all of them. But all these, uh, this between now and the year 2030, they basically anchored by, by three pillars, Sarawak is entered by three pillars. One, economic well-being for the people of Sarawak uh, and, 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 and investors, of course. Social uh, equality uh, for the various uh, tribes and people of the state. And the last one, is, which is very important right now, is environmental sustainability. So sustainability is a very, very big word and something that we take extremely seriously now, okay? Now, uh, what are the opportunities in Sarawak? Uh, the, I will just quickly summarize that and I'll be happy to answer questions later on during the Q&A session. Now, there's a very big, big push now for Sarawak that goes into green energy and renewable technology, as well as circular economy. It is a very, very big theme. Sarawak has you know, gets 70% of our energy source from renewable energy. And right now it's roughly about five, Five and a half thousand megawatts of power is generated by Sarawak. Five and a half thousand, of which seventy percent are from renewable source, especially mainly from hydro. Uh, we've got four hydro dams and a few more are being built. The total uh, Sarawak is going to expand is uh, is uh, is renewable energy and the green energy to to twelve thousand megawatts. Twelve thousand megawatts is a lot in the next uh, ten years. Twelve thousand megawatts is roughly how much Singapore as a country consumes right now in 2021. So it is the equivalent of all energy consumed in, in, the, in, the, in, in the Republic of Singapore, 12,000 megawatts. So they're gonna go from 5,500 right now to roughly 12,000 megawatts. And this most of it will, will come from hydro, will probably make out about, uh, you know, about 90% of it. And the balance of it will come from solar. And uh, you, you soon be hearing from uh, our, our Charlie Yo, probably from El Gay and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, last night, uh, there was a first green data center was signed and you're gonna be at a new data center with 400 megawatts of uh, power needs over a period of time between a company in Sarawak and, uh, and a company in Singapore. So it was signed only last night. I was at the function when uh, this uh, data center was signed. So right now exporting uh, roughly about 100 megawatts of, uh, of green energy to Indonesia. They swing across and about a thousand megawatts of energy will be supplied to Singapore when they swing up the big line across the Singapore. This will happen in the next two to three years, I think. So, so there's a plan power to Singapore as well. So this is a very big theme. So in the energy, uh, green energy, renewed technology and circular, circular, circular economy thing is very big. Second one is uh, recently we played a very big part now. It's called carbon capture, carbon storage, 
okay, and carbon trading. So uh, two, a few agreements have been signed uh, with one with a Korean company, one with a Japanese company, for them to uh, effectively collect carbon in a in a in a in a in a, in a liquid form to be pumped into the uh, used wells in Sarawak to be stored in perpetuity. There are roughly about 1,600 used oil wells off the coast of Sarawak. And Sarawak, there are only three areas in the whole world that is geologically stable enough or it has this ability to store carbon. Uh, okay, one is in Sarawak. The second one is somewhere off Norway. And the third one is near Houston. There's only three places in the whole world. So Sarawak is going to do that into carbon capture carbon storage uh, in, in our used oil wells. There's 1,660 of them, I think, oil wells that will be used for that. Now, uh, so this is a big thing. And, and of course, uh, carbon trading now has been worked out. The state has passed uh, some legislation to, uh, to do that. Um, now, uh, the other thing that is, uh, 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 that, uh, is a lot of emphasis right now is uh, someone wants to be attached to the global supply chain. And in this respect, Singapore and China plays a very big role here because it's of, of uh, proximity to Singapore and to China. Then there's a lot, there's always huge amount of money dumped into infrastructure development in the whole state. We just completed uh, more or less complete, about 95% complete, uh, it's a pan Borneo highway in Sarawak costing 20 billion ringgit, 20 billion, just over 20 billion, that's roughly approximately four and a half billion US dollar just completed. So we got pretty good highway now. It's about 1,200 over kilometers running the length of Sarawak. Uh, but there's always things to be done there. Uh, so a new port is being planned and uh, will be built in uh, Kuching. The old port, uh, I remember the old port was built uh, by Dragage, one of the French company years ago, maybe about I don't know, 25 years ago, Paul Ravelli was, was very much in the know about that project. Uh, the Gaj built that. Uh, so that's years ago, but a new port is being planned. I think it will be, uh, it will come about in the next uh, five or 10 years. Other opportunities that has been pushed a lot by the Sarawak government are, a, are agriculture. This is, uh, you look at number, number, number two up there in, in, in that chart on, 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 this, uh, on this presentation. Agriculture has been pushed. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic have done wonders uh, to the world. In the past, it, people always talk about just in time. Nowadays, everybody talks about just in case. So Sarawak, uh, Singapore have uh, decided that uh, Sarawak is going to be the uh, just, just in case uh, food basket uh, because food security has become very, very important to some countries around the world. And uh, Sarawak is uh, putting in a lot of effort because Sarawak has got abundant land huge uh, abundant sunlight uh, we got an abundant clean water something like Sarawak has got a rate for about 11 or 12 feet uh, per year so huge uh, abundant clean water uh, there's there not that many industries over here so water is pretty clean so agriculture is pretty big tourism is be pushed as uh, one of the uh, product uh, the next item the tourism forestry is a kind of uh, employs a lot of people, but it's not really being pushed anymore because it is not something good that uh, Sarawak wants to be associated with other than planted forests. So last night uh, there was a, a presentation, uh, somebody they're planting 7 million trees, uh, polonia trees in, uh, in Sarawak in, in, in the area called Kapit, 7 million trees. Uh, Polenia is a species of timber, fast growing timber. And, um, uh, mining, they talk about that, but they don't really, really want to talk too much about that. There's some coal mining, there's some gypsum, there's some, uh, and all sort of thing. And there's gold mining years ago, but no longer viable, I think, because gold mining is what they brought the Chinese, I think, to Sarawak in the first place. <laughs> and then the services, as you know, are pretty big. And the manufacturing is not very big, other than there are a lot of manufacturing by the international people, especially the Japanese. The Koreans and the Chinese are very big. They're into uh, like uh, they're, they're into uh, aluminium. Uh, they're into uh, this uh, they call ferro alloys. They're into uh, uh, solar panels and all, all those kind of things. So there is uh, there's something like about maybe about twenty companies over here in Sarawak that's doing that. Mainly high energy consumption industry that probably employs I don't know maybe about forty thousand people in, in, in Kuching and Bintulu. Uh, Bintulu is the main one, but there's also uh, one in uh, 
Kuching. And as I know about a steel mill is being planned for Lundu, about six billion US dollar, six billion US dollar steel mill by the Chinese. Okay, now so now the Another yeah. well. no, so one minute. Okay, the Sarawak has got a very strong government support to do a lot of things that we do. Uh, and uh, there are virtually no corruption in Sarawak, very little corruption over here. Okay, some of the challenges, the government drives most of the big projects. Okay, number one, number two, 99% of companies in Sarawak are SME, 99%. There's a huge chapter needs in many, many things we do in Sarawak, something like about <laughs> three or 400 billion ringgit, which is about like about 100 billion US dollar. Uh, we yeah, there's a very competitive environment to do big businesses for international companies. As I say, the Chinese are very big uh, involved, the Americans are involved, the Japanese are involved, the Koreans are involved, and the Singaporeans are very much involved right now. They, the Sarokans are very, very uh, cautious people. They, especially the, the private sector, they tend to uh, move very slowly and get to know people first before they deal. So there's basically the, some of the challenges and some of the uh, uh, opportunity so I'll be happy to take any questions and answers later on uh, and I'll be happy to stay back and you can put up whatever it is so anyway SBF so cable commerce uh, is, will be very happy to host any delegations that you may want to come to Sarawak and I was I was told that what is being planned towards the end of this year thank you very much thank you very very much uh, Dr. Philip that's uh, you gave a very very broad view of uh, Sarawak and uh, the uh, uh, what's being uh, highlighted by the government and, and all the activities that are coming on uh, for SARA for the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, I'll move on uh, quickly to uh, Kelvin. Uh, Mr. Kelvin Yeo uh, is speaking on behalf of Recorder, which is the, uh, the state economic activity, uh, which was uh, set up to, to uh, oversee and manage uh, SCORE, which is the SARA Corridor for Renewable Energy. Uh, over to you, Kelvin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I'll be presenting on the Sarawak Corridor of Renewable Energy uh, next. Okay, this will be the contents of my presentation for the next uh, 10 minutes. I'll start with the score and recorder. Next. Next. Okay, so Sarawak Corridor of Renewable Energy. Um, was uh, established way back in 2006 when uh, Recorda was set up to oversee and manage the uh, SCORE development plan. And uh, SCORE area is, is uh, it spans uh, more than 100,000 square kilometer, which is about uh, two thirds of Sarawak size, covering from the central region of Sarawak, as you can see from the map, all the way up to the uh, northern part of Sarawak, which is uh, in Lawas. Uh, that is like uh, very uh, near to Sabah. And uh, score leverage on the uh, clean renewable energy and our vast uh, natural resources to drive uh, the energy intensive industries and also uh, to attract uh, other investments uh, into SCORE. And uh, in 2017, the Sarawak government uh, created three development agencies under Recorda and the three agencies are Upper Rajang Development Agency, Highland Development Agency, and Northern Region Development Agency to fast track the uh, infrastructure development in the SCORE region. Next. So these are the 12 priority industries in the SCORE region, uh, aluminum, glass, steel, metal, oil palm based aquaculture, Timber base, when we talk about timber base, it's more on the downstream. And then the marine engineering, oil and gas, tourism, livestock, biotechnology, and digital technology. Next. So um, these are the uh, power generation for the score region. Uh, we have the Murum uh, Dam hydroelectric uh, plant, which uh, can generate uh, 944 megawatt. Bali, um, dam, uh, which can generate 1,284 megawatt, and Bale Dam is ex expected to be completed by uh, 2027. And then Bakun uh, Dam, uh, which can generate 2,400 megawatt. And at the same time, we also have the Muka Coal Fire Plant, Tanjong Kidurong uh, Combined Cycle Gas Turbine, which can generate 842 megawatt. 
and the Balingan coal uh, fire plant, we can generate uh, 600 megawatts. So uh, all these uh, generate power for the industries in Skor region. Next. So this is the grid of uh, the power generation uh, in Sarawak in the Skor region. Next. So uh, what is uh, RECODA or Regional Corridor Development Authority? Basically, RECODA has been entrusted by the government to oversee the overall development of SCO. And RECODA is the investment promotion agency. At the same time, um, we also uh, have been entrusted by the Sarawak government to undertake infrastructure projects in the SCO region with the setup of the three agencies, which I mentioned earlier. And at the same time, uh, RECODA has also been entrusted by the Sarawak government, as well as the federal government of Malaysia to um, undertake some socio-economic programs to uplift the uh, livelihood of the people in the school region. Next. So uh, this is our board members. Uh, our board is chaired by our premier, uh, Dato' Patinggi Tan Sri Abang Haji Johari, Tun Abang Haji Openg. So from here, you can see that uh, our board members are all high powered people in the state. And also uh, uh, we are represent, uh, and also uh, they, they, they are representatives from the federal government. Next. So this is our strategic pillars, like what I've mentioned. Um, uh, we are the investment promotion agency. At the same time, we are, uh, uh, undertaking uh, some infrastructure projects in the score region and also uh, social economic programs. Next. So this is our governance structure. We have three divisions, investment promotion division, project management division, and corporate services uh, division. And uh, we have three development agencies under our purview, uh, Upper Rajang, Island Development, and Northern Region. Next. Next. So um, these are the three development agencies. Uh, you, from here, you can see uh, the chairman of the respective uh, development agency and the areas covered under each uh, development agency. Next. Next. So um, at the same time, uh, we have also come up with master plans for the Upper Rajan Development Agency area. From here, you can see uh, we have Bakun master plan, and then we have Belaga master plan and Kapit master plan. Next. And we have also uh, done the master plans for the HDA area. From here, you can see we have master plan for Mulu, Barrio, and also for the Integrated Highland Agriculture Station, which uh, was completed uh, two years ago. Next. And master plans for the Northern Region Development uh, Agency, which covers area in Limbang and Lawas. So we have master plan for Sunda, Trusan, and uh, we are going to build a new Lawas airport. And uh, we have also uh, done the Marapok master plan, and the new Lawas deep water port complex. Next. Next. So uh, overall, uh, RECODA under the three development agencies, we are doing 266 uh, infrastructure projects in all these uh, three development agency areas. And at the same time, we are also uh, doing uh, nine federal infrastructure projects, mainly in the Samalaju Industrial Park, which I'm going to touch uh, later on. So with a total uh, project cost under the state funded project of 12.7 billion and involves 172 consultants in total. And the federal project cost uh, is uh, 2.9 billion. Next. So this is the Samalaju Industrial Park. From here, you can see the aerial view. Samalaju so Industrial Park is about uh, one hour drive from Bintulu town. So here we are doing the uh, road project in the industrial park. Next. And at the same time, we are also doing the water supply project phase two for the Samalaju Industrial Park. 
next. So uh, I'm going to talk about the mega projects that uh, we are going to undertake under the Sarawak government uh, funding. This is the Northern Coastal Highway. Basically, Northern Coastal Highway is the phase two of the Pen Borneo Highway, which uh, Dato Philip Ting mentioned earlier. So uh, we rename it as a Northern Coastal Highway, and it covers the Bimbang section, which is 44 kilometer, and another section is Lawas. Next, Lawa section is 43.5 kilometers. So both sections cover about 87 kilometers in total. And we expect to kickstart this project uh, in one year time. Next. So another mega project that Recorda is going to do is the proposed roads linking Miri, Marudi, Marudi, Mulu, Kuala Melina, and Long Panai, Long Lama in Miri. Next, this project is still under the planning stage and um, it will cover about 130 kilometers connecting all these uh, rural areas in the northern part of Sarawak. Next, so this is the overall uh, road network once all these infrastructure projects are completed. From here, you can see the, the northern coastal highway and then the uh, Miri Marudi to Long Lama Road Project, which covers 160.5 kilometers, so on and so forth. So this will be the total road network in Sarawak. Next. Next. So this is the summary of the approved private investment in SCO so far. As of March 2023, the total approved private investment received is 105.86 billion ringgit. And we have created a total of 50,343 uh, jobs. And uh, the total number of projects is 377. Next. So this is uh, the landscape of Samalaju from its uh, early days in 1996. And uh, the latest picture that we've got is from June 2015. But of course, the landscape has uh, changed uh, now. Next. So this is the uh, aerial view. Next. So this is to show you the evolution of Samalaju Industrial Park from 2008 until today. Next. So these are the companies operating in Samalaju Industrial Park, which has a total of 8,000 hectares. And in fact, Samalaju Industrial Park is the biggest industrial park in Malaysia. So among the companies operating in Samalaju Industrial Park now is OCIM, Pertama Ferro Alloys, OM Materials, Iwatani SIG Industrial, Press Metal, Sakura Ferro Alloys, PMB Silicon, Elkem Carbon Malaysia, Malaysian Phosphat and uh, Winan Steel. And uh, currently Winan Steel is still uh, doing uh, its site preparation. So uh, next. Another minute, Kevin. Hello, yeah. Another minute for you, thank you. So uh, this is to show the pictures of those uh, companies operating in Samalaju. Next. Next. So these are the facilities in Samalaju Industrial Park. We have uh, Samalaju Industrial Port, next. And Samalaju Resort Hotel run by Samalaju Properties. And Samalaju Eco Park also run by Samalaju Properties in Yambrahat, next. So in conclusion, uh, Sarawak Osco is um, economically and politically stable and uh, we put a uh, high priority in upgrading our infrastructure projects like what I've mentioned earlier on, uh, which are carried out by the three development agencies on the Recorda. And uh, thus, uh, SCO has huge investment potentials with uh, attractive investments incentives. I think that's all uh, my presentation for this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Calvin. Um, that was very helpful to, to have that uh, graphic as well of, of Sarawak to understand. 
uh, where Kuching is and uh, uh, respect to the rest of Sarawak. So it's, as you can see, it's a very, very big state um, and uh, a lot of development as well going on into some of the regions which are not been, uh, uh, have not had much development at all in, in the past. So uh, Urda, HDA and NRDA. Uh, but uh, interesting, uh, interesting fact, uh, um, if you were to travel from Kuching to the northern part of, of, uh, of Sarawak, you'd have to cross the border uh, approximately eight times, leaving Sarawak, going to Brunei, leaving Brunei, going into Sarawak, uh, going back, leaving Brunei, going back into Sarawak, and uh, leaving Brunei back into Sarawak. So it's, uh, that, that's the plan which uh, Kelvin mentioned, they're building a, a road so that there's connectivity within uh, Sarawak itself, so we don't have to cross into, uh, into uh, Brunei to access uh, uh, the rest of the state. Um, thank you, Kelvin. Um, we'll Welcome. move swiftly across to um, uh, Dr. Charlie Yeo from the uh, Sarawak Biodiversity Center. He is the uh, Chief Executive Officer um, of uh, uh, FBC, SBC since uh, 2014. Um, and uh, um, he's got some very, very exciting uh, uh, technologies and um, biodiversity news to, to talk about. Uh, over to you, Dr. Charlie. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alexis, and also the organizers who invited me to give this talk today. It's a very short talk. And here, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, algae is it's probably in its infancy stage, and it has the potential to become uh, a mega project under Recorda, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I wanted to craft the title a little bit, uh, just to leave out the sustainable aviation view for now, because I think my my partners are more uh, uh, able to discuss or talk about in this area. But for now, I'm going to talk about what is algae, what does SBC do, and why is algae so attractive, yeah? Next one. Um, so before we start, I want to take this opportunity to inform uh, the Malaysian French uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry that Sarawak has put on a very high emphasis on innovation. And, and research. And, and as you can see from what Dr. Philip Ting has presented, innovation is one of the clusters of PCDS uh, 2030. So it is a huge emphasis for Sarawak. So I hope it appeals to most of the companies who are into innovation and, and, and look at Sarawak in a very different way other than the rainforest, yeah? Uh, so for the content of this talk, I wanna talk about the background of SBC a little bit. And I, I want to talk about uh, why libraries of the biodiversity, uh, why do we build these things? And well, why was it built like many years ago, almost 25 years ago? And also lastly, how does this library uh, lead to the algae project at SBC? Yeah, next slide. All right, so very general, SBC is on a 50 acre land. Uh, we have a vision that look at enriching lives through breakthrough innovations in biodiversity. The mission is to decode biodiversity for the benefit of Sarawak. But if you don't read the vision and the mission, I mean, the very short form of what describe we, what we do at SBC is this tagline uh, by Dr. John Cumbers, who says that there is more money in the Borneo rainforest biodiversity than its deforestation. And Dr. Cumbers was here visiting SBC when he wrote that article in uh, Forbes on, in 2019, yeah? Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so why libraries and why do we do libraries, right? Uh, at first it started as like, you know, three researchers are very reluctant to go into the, uh, go into the jungle to, to collect plants and all that. So we thought that we should build libraries so that they can just do all their research work at SBC. So one thing led to another. If you look at the thousands of samples and hundreds and hundreds of uh, samples that we have in the library, you will see that under algae, we have 653 strains that was collected a long time ago uh, in collaboration with Mitsubishi Corporation. Yeah, next slide. Or you might want to know that there's also 600 uh, essential oils that we collected from the library. Next slide, please. All right, uh, just a bit of history, how it started. It started in 2012 with a CSR project with Mitsubishi Corporation. There, we just 
wanted to go around Sarawak and collect living specimens of algae and keep them alive uh, for the next 10 years or so while we are looking at ways to develop it. And also during that collaboration, which is funded all by Mitsubishi Corporation, we managed to set up a pilot plant of uh, 1,000 meters square and using a very unique model to grow algae, which is flat panels, as you can see in the background here. Uh, we found that this is the most uh, optimal way to grow algae in the tropics. Yeah, And as time go on, we, we collaborated with uh, Diamond Gas Holding, which is a subsidiary of Mitsubishi. And further on, I'll talk a little bit about our collaboration with Chitose and also Ineos and also Sarang Energy. Next slide, please. All right, now in, in the name of the microalgae library, if you look at it, what's what really interested uh, us uh, in terms of the research part was that if you look at number 224, uh, 224 just signifies uh, the strains of algae that we collected that doesn't have any reported use in any of the literature. So here it represents to us a very, uh, a very interesting area that we can look on and do research here. Yeah? Next slide, please. Now, in terms of what microalgae can do, I think uh, Dr. Philip Ding has talked a little bit about circular economy. Here, algae just needs sunshine, natural light, uh, water, and also uh, some uh, ingredient, what do you call it? Uh, some nutrients for it to grow and temperature, and then, and then it just takes off. And what you can you do from algae is that uh, there are several components you can use from there, lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, uh, as well as a, a very small amount of ash. And you can see the multiple products you can use that are derivative from these uh, four products. Yeah? Next slide. All right, this is just a, a video of what it looks like. Uh, what I wanted to highlight was that uh, we managed to achieve uh, quite a significant number, I think, of 21 gram per meter square per day in terms of our production. I think the, the highest was about maybe 30 or something that was recorded by uh, USA. But for our purposes, we grow it out, outdoors and outdoors can be different from what you can get indoors. Yeah. Next slide. And from the 1,000 meters square, we have moved on to open up a five hectare plot, which is uh, residing next to a coal fire plant. The purpose there was that we're gonna tap the CO2 from the coal fire plant, and we're gonna bubble it through the algae culture. And this in effect can boost the production of the algae biomass. And as you can see there, that uh, the production that we predicted based on the numbers that we have, there is about 350 tons per year. And for this, uh, it is a collaboration between uh, Chitose Energy, uh, Sarang Energy, as well as Enos and SBC. And we're gonna grow from a five hectare plot next to a hundred hectare and then to a 2000. Um, and we can talk about what is the investment cost like later if you are interested. Next one. All right. So with algae, it wasn't very successful in the USA. Uh, there is, I think the reason for that is because of the business plan. And the business plan was one company, one product, and then it's going against oil and gas industry. Here, I think the business plan has been changed by the Japanese. The Japanese look at the consortium, uh, setting up one uh, that is called a Missouri uh, project in Japan, where all these companies, wanted to uh, look at su sustainability and a society that is based on algae. Uh, here, uh, we, we, SPC is one of the supporting partner. And I'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about why this can perhaps be successful and, and a key ingredient to making this uh, microalgae uh, industry start in Sarawak, yeah? Next one. All right, it's just a slide about well, what is the issues that we have with algae nowadays, and it's been reported all over. And that's three things, scale, and you also have technology issues. And of course, the last one is the price. 
Uh, if you're doing biofuels, you always have to go up against the price of oil and gas. But if you're looking at proteins, you're looking at carbohydrates, and you're looking at other kinds of lipids for nutraceuticals, for human use and all that, and that's a different ball game. Yeah. Next slide. All right, this is, I, I just wanted to say that we are collaborating with somebody in UC San Diego, but uh, who makes uh, algae shoes and algae surfboards, so on and so forth, right? Next slide. All right, so what do we know that, the, uh, what do we don't know about what the Japanese know, okay? Now, perhaps this can be, be illustrated in this slide here, where as a lot of uh, organizations or companies or, and all that says that algae is on the downturn and all that. The Japanese, on the other hand, is giving more emphasis on algae. As you can see here in the World Expo 2025, the exhibitors there under the Japanese, uh, what do you call it? The Japanese group, whereas they're going to dedicate about one third of the exhibition to just algae. So that really emphasizes how algae is going to come on uh, in this part of the world in the future. And this is gonna be uh, perhaps some, perhaps what Sarawak is gonna leverage on as one of its uh, industry in the future. Next slide. Oh, that's all there I, I have, yeah. Okay, I got nine seconds left. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Charlie. Um, brilliant timing, <laughs> very well done. <laughs> Thank you for that very insightful uh, uh, presentation. And uh, um, I, I think uh, there's, it's very interesting to see what, uh, what we can do further with, with uh, algae. Um, I'll move across to uh, Miss uh, Emily uh, Rolanda from uh, UOB Bank, uh, who will be uh, giving a, uh, a testimonial uh, with regards to business in, 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 uh, in Sarawak. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you to um, Malaysian French Chamber of Commerce and Industry um, for organizing this webinar to promote investment opportunities for Sarawak. I think as the largest foreign bank in Malaysia and in Southeast Asia, we are excited and always on the lookout for opportunities to connect businesses from around the world. My name is Emily and I'm the branch manager for Kuching. As a startup, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, as a start, I thought it would be good to give a brief introduction of UOB Group. We were established in 1935, and interestingly, our founding father, Dr. Suri Wee Keng Chiang, actually came from Kuching, Sarawak. Our present UOB Group CEO, Wee Yi Chiang, is the grandson. We have 500, over 500 branches around the world with regional connectivity. We are a strongly rated bank, not just at our head office in Singapore, but also in all our subsidiaries. Next slide, please. Our strong regional footprint in Southeast Asia region, especially in all the key markets in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand and Vietnam are well placed to help companies understand the opportunities in local markets. I think we have been very active in connecting FDIs to all these, potential, all these countries. Next slide, please. So for UOB, we have 55 branches across the country, making us the leading foreign bank in Malaysia. Next slide. UOB's presence in Sarawak, we have four branches. Uh, the, in the Man district, which is Kuching, Cebu, Bintulu, and Miri. We also have three branches in Saba. Next slide, please. Okay. We have set up the FDI, FDI advisory unit more than 10 years ago to support global companies like you to expand your business in Malaysia. We recognize the importance to support Companies with not just their banking needs, but also beyond the banking needs. For example, connecting you with the government, like agencies like Malaysia Investment Development Authority, MIDA, and professional service providers like company secretaries, hacks, legal accounting, and industry part players. Since last year, we have been in close collaboration with Sarawak Trade and Tourism Company, better known as Status in promoting and bringing in investors to Sarawak. 
we assist, assisted with connecting lawyers and company secretary to provide advisory service to potential investors and show what are the requirements and share with them what are the requirements to set up business in the state. We also assisted FDI companies to open accounts and also provide support in the banking requirement at both company and also the individual level. Meaning we also helped the uh, employees in the company to actually open account and to do the salary payroll and all that. In addition to that, we have also assisted FDIs in the working capital requirement and also provide financing to support the capital investments. Last year, we also have been very active in the uh, SMM2H, which is the Sarawak My Second Home program. We have actually facilitated more than 200 foreign individuals in the application for SMM2H because uh, the Sarawak government is actually very active in promoting this program. We are actually a partner, uh, the next slide please. Yeah, we are actually in partner with MIDA. Uh, it's a memorandum of understanding whereby we work together to attract more FDIs into Malaysia and into this case to Sarawak. Um, we actually have been working very closely with MIDA on this piece. And we also like connect uh, link FDIs with the local supply chain so that they can support the business growth and expansion locally. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, and this ends my brief presentation. Please feel free to get in touch with us and I look forward to working closely with uh, Malaysia French Chamber of Commerce and Industry to welcoming more French companies to Sarawak. Merci beaucoup. Many, many thanks, Emily. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. And uh, I'll uh, uh, pass it across to Gilles um, to go through any of the questions which uh, have surfaced or um, in the, for the, uh, because of the time, we might actually have to address the questions a little bit later as uh, I believe Michelle also wants to to have a, a quick word with regards to uh, the proposed program in uh, in October for our Sarah visit. So yeah, thank you to all the speakers. I hope um, uh, those who join join this uh, session uh, have a better feeling and understanding on all what's happening uh, these past few years and now what's happening in in Sarawak. Uh, from all the infrastructure developments, the green technology developments, uh, and so on. I mean, uh, Philip has done a brief summary on all the sectors. Um, in terms of question, you guys have been very shy uh, so far. Not many questions. Maybe just quick ones to come back to, to those who, who have been posted. Uh, the first one, maybe either to, to you, Alex, or further to Philip on the on the topic of uh, incorporation of uh, Sarawak companies uh, for oil and gas and the need to have a uh, quota on uh, Sarawakian native equity. Uh, Alexi, maybe it's your sector, you want to say a bit more on that? Um, thank, thank you, Gilles. Um, I think the best uh, person or entity to answer that would be Petros. Petros, uh, also known as Petroleum Sarawak, is the, the, uh, the, the state authority that's looking after the uh, uh, hydrocarbon uh, exploitation in Sarawak. Um, yes, there are uh, requirements to have uh, Sarawak content, and I believe there there also um, uh, if you're if you're an oil and gas uh, company, you can uh, register. Uh, directly with uh, Petros to provide your services, but uh, uh, I need to double check, or you, you need to double check with Petros directly to to know the local content, as in the Sara content. There, uh, but uh, Sara Petros does have a register of uh, vendors, uh, and normally those vendors would also be having the um, uh, registration with uh, with Petronas, which is the SWEC. Uh, licensing uh, 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 system. Uh, so I, I think they are in the process of actually drafting a way forward for some of the bigger entities or bigger companies that 
uh, are trying to uh, look at opportunities in, in Sarawak and, and how to, to work with a, a local partner here, a joint venture entity or, or whatever it is. So I think that's being currently drafted up. I, I will try and, uh, as soon as I get some information, I can disseminate it. Thanks, Alex. So oil and gas is a bit particular in Malaysia, in uh, Sarawak and Malaysia in general anyway. Uh, maybe a broader question to that for all the other members. Uh, Dr. Philip, if a company wants to venture into Sarawak to make business or to set up uh, a branch, uh, is it recommended or practice to have a local partner or JV or can they venture directly into Sarawak? What is uh, the business practice there? Uh, it depends on what it is, uh, Joe. Uh, you know, if you talk about you know the oil and gas, yes, answer is yes. Uh, some industry you don't, uh, some industry you do. But generally, it is advisable that you have a bit of local content because they will know how to navigate all the issues for you on the ground. That would be my recommendation. Anyway, depend on the industry. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question on uh, for SBC. Uh, company want to venture into essential oils and fragrance. How can they work with S SBC on that? Sure, I, I I would just suggest that they they connect to us and uh, talk to us about what they really uh, need in terms of this type of essential oils. Uh, just to remember. Remember that the 600 essential oils that we collect from the jungle, uh, some are in a huge way, there is a scale to it, uh, which we can collect, but some are still in very small volumes, uh, manageable, uh, and manageable in terms of our R&D and also for testing. Uh, we also have the chemical profiles for all these uh, essential oils because we have uh, the analytical instruments in the laboratory here to run all this. So you have information readily available uh, and you can study which one would you like. And if you know what you like, I can easily tell you whether we have it or we don't have it or we have an alternative for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will post this. Talvin, your recorder. Uh, development, great projects. Uh, what about the availability of uh, skilled or semi-skilled workers, the, the need for resources associated to these developments? Kevin? Uh, you're muted. You're on mute, Kevin. Okay. The Israel government is welcoming uh, skilled and semi-skilled uh, uh, workers from foreign countries to make up uh, the manpower in- I think the question is uh, the other way around. If uh, somebody invests in Sarawak, would the manpower be available for those companies? Yeah, in fact, uh, in Sarawak, we are welcoming all these uh, skilled and semi-skilled workers. And at the same time, like what I mentioned earlier, uh, Recorda is doing the social economic program. So one of those programs is to uplift uh, the skill of the local workers where we are collaborating with some of the skill training institutes uh, to train them on the skills uh, needed by some of these industries. So in terms of the manpower, we don't foresee any problem. And uh, secondly, um, Sarawakians, uh, we are multilingual and uh, we are able to adapt to the culture. So in terms of the state government, in fact, the Sarawak government is welcoming uh, some of these uh, skilled workers from overseas. So uh, manpower-wise, um, to me, uh, it's not an issue at all. Okay, hey, thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, green hydrogen project in Sarawak. Anyone wants to share a bit on this? Uh, yes, yes, I can. I can. I know a little bit about that. Uh, Sarawak has got a has got a program working with Petronas in Malaysia. They are trying to bring down the cost of green hydrogen production. It used to be roughly need used to need about 60 kilowatt hours to produce one kilogram of green hydrogen. But recently there is a breakthrough right now. Now they are achieving roughly about 30, uh, 30 kilowatt hours to produce a kilogram of green hydrogen in the lab. So there's a lot of thing working with Petronas. There are two, there, there, there are a few other companies in one minute. There are two Australian companies uh, looking into green hydrogen. 
and one Japanese company in, into green hydrogen. The two Australian, the, the, and also yesterday, I just understand there's a six billion US dollar investment by another Australian company as of yesterday that has expressed a green hydrogen, uh, six billion uh, US dollar. Now they, they, the, 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 uh, the, the Australian company, well, maybe I, don't, I shouldn't mention names about that. Uh, they, uh, two of them are looking into uh, uh, exporting, uh, producing green hydrogen using uh, this uh, this the dam. One, one of them will propose to build their own dam, and uh, it will be exported in the form of ammonia. The third one is uh, the Japanese one is to be exporting it as methane. So uh, there are there are there. Are, I know of at least four proposals now on green hydrogen in the state. Each of these are multi-billion US dollar. Yes, answer is yes. Okay. I don't know whether Thank you answer, answer your question or not. Yes. So four of them. Yes. Yeah, four of them. So um, we are running out of time. Um, if anyone has further question, we will definitely continue to answer and reply in writing uh, for the additional questions. So you can continue to post Q&A. Maybe a last one, Philip. Uh, I don't know about CCS project. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the only ones I know CCS is uh, the, the project between the Sarah Gama and the Korean company and the CCS between one uh, with, a, with a Japanese company. I don't uh, hear a lot about that other than to, that they are uh, looking into the facility of how are they going to ship it from the utilities in Korea and utilities in Japan to be buried uh, uh, into the uh, into the uh, this uh, this depleted uh, oil wells of offshore of Sarawak. Uh, the legislation has already been passed, uh, already in place. Sarawak just recently passed a whole lot of, of uh, legislation to support this. How fast are they moving on this? I'm not sure. But you are talking about big scale, right? By by by, by this, if they're talking about this big for them to go into huge huge uh, sovereign tankers to move this kind of thing from Japan and from Korea to Sarawak, I think they're pretty big. Yeah? Uh, I don't know the size, so thank you. Thank you. I, I, um, sorry, Jill, I, I believe uh, one of the projects where CCS is actually uh, part of is the Kasawari project, which is uh, uh, the main, uh, the main uh, company that's doing the construction there for that uh, particular area is uh, Technip, Technip FMC. Uh, and it does include some CCS uh, components in there as well. And the last question, uh, and I leave this answer to Michel, who will conclude on this uh, session, is what does a French company present in Sarawak in, in what sector? Michel, all to you. Merci, uh, Gilles. Can you all hear me? Okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, thanks everyone for for this uh, successful uh, uh, webinar, and thanks for our speakers uh, from the Sarawak Chamber, from the SD, SDC, on uh, Recoda, on UOB also. Um, as we discussed with Gilles and Alex, Alexis, if we did today a webinar on Sarawak, is basically because the French presence, French direct presence in Sarawak is very limited. Uh, we had in the past a few entrepreneurs in the tourism sector. We had uh, uh, also some uh, uh, French companies uh, linked to the oil and gas sectors who had some activities in the Miri. Uh, however, uh, today what we have is indirect presence of companies who are established in the peninsula in the Seminole zone and uh, who are working on the potential developing potential project with local partners in, uh, in Sarawak. But uh, at this point of time, as such, uh, we are not aware of any, uh, I would say, uh, fully established with an office and with the staff uh, presence of French companies. We know that Total Energy is looking at developing activities in uh, Sarawak, among other things. Uh, Saint Gobain is also looking at the state. Uh, these are the, just a look about the industrial sectors. And uh, back to tourism, I think we could have some uh, uh, companies uh, established in the peninsula uh, looking at developing to Sarawak because, as uh, you mentioned, as uh, Dato Philippe mentioned, 
the tourism sector is, is quite promising. Um, the future uh, after this uh, webinar, we are going to uh, send to all participants a questionnaire. Uh, and we are going to propose, uh, as uh, Alexis mentioned at the beginning of this uh, session, we want to look at the possibility of uh, uh, organizing, uh, possibly around the months of October, after the summer, uh, possibly organize, organizing uh, a business trip, a business delegation to, to Sarawak, which will obviously uh, cover touching uh, on depending on the values, uh, uh, depending on the composition of the delegation, or also with visits to potential visits to Bintolu, Miri, and why not to the Bakundam? Because Bakundam will represent uh, a very diverse uh, options. So, first, a questionnaire to be sent to everyone to get your feedbacks and maybe to get a little bit of uh, ideas about what people would like. And after that, uh, hopefully within the next month, we could come up with a program uh, which could be proposed for uh, October. And we hope to have the support of our speakers, uh, our various organizations, RECODA, the Sarawak Chamber, and the uh, SDS, the VC, and the other organization, UB, of course, to support us to make a successful uh, trip to Sarawak. That's all for me. Uh, I let uh, Gilles and uh, Alex close, uh, our, our two leaders, uh, to close uh, this, uh, this session. And thank you again to everybody for your participation. Thank you, Michel. For me, just the only message I have is there is a train leaving the station. Based on the different presentation, we see that the European and the French present is very mild on this uh, on this train, and we need to be there uh, to help our Sarawak colleagues uh, to make Sarawak a great state. Thank you for me. Yes, uh, thank you, Gilles, and thank you very much to all the, uh, the speakers and for everybody who's uh, joined in on the call. Um, and uh, echoing what Gilles said, there's, there's, uh, we would like to see a lot more activity here from the, uh, the European sector, the, the, the chamber. Um, there's a lot, lot of opportunities here. And as you can see, that's, uh, uh, there's a, quite a lot of vibrancy and there's a lot of uh, keenness to, 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 um, to attract uh, uh, companies and investors into so thank you again um, for everybody, for, for the speakers especially, for being here. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us on the call. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.